virtues um, in uh, that sense that uh, we can uh, find in the beginning of À la recherche du temps perdu, uh, when uh, Marcel Proust is describing this uh, um, uh, enlightenment with uh, the magic lantern in his uh, home. And um, yes, it's because it was mainly used uh, in toys, in toy lanterns and not in uh, um, professional ones. Uh, the loops can be described as an intersection between uh, cinema and uh, magic lantern um, as they used uh, um, a, a projection system. Uh, and the magic uh, lantern manufacturers um, after the presentation of the cinematographic pro um, uh, the, by the cinematographe uh, of uh, uh, Brothers Lumière, uh, started to build uh, new types of lanterns uh, that had the peculiar system uh, to project slides, both slides and films. Uh, our research is using mainly uh, the collection uh, deposited at Cinematech Suisse, but also catalogues, um, uh, press uh, and uh, patents, uh, a lot of different kinds of material uh, we find internationally and uh, we aim to gather. Uh, the production of the loops, uh, I will change, uh, really starts in 1897. Uh, and comes from Germany, uh, more precisely from Nuremberg, uh, where the main toy manufacturers uh, had gathered. The first model created by Georges Carrette was still horizontal, uh, but the film, 35 millimeter formats, were projected intermittently, uh, thanks to a five-pointed Maltese cross. That's very characteristic of cinematographic process of projection and uh, other manufacturers, uh, German manufacturers uh, followed as uh, the uh, Ernest Planck or the Bing uh, Brothers. Uh, and uh, they followed the path, but in vertical scrolling, 35 millimeter also with addition type perforation. Um, and then uh, followed uh, French manufacturers too, uh, mainly uh, Lapierre, who uh, began to work with famous animators as Ogalo and Lortac. So we can see there one of this loop to begin uh, with um, um, a practical example. Mm. So, uh, the link between cinema and the Magic Lantern will be uh, all the time um, uh, at the, um, yes, the, the sense of our, our research. The hybridization is very clear uh, between Magic Lantern and cinema when it begins uh, early 20th century, the production of plates on flexible celluloid uh, um, and uh, correspond, uh, corresponding exactly to the aesthetic uh, of a traditional uh, magic lantern, uh, but using the same material as the uh, chromolithographic loops that was not nitrate, that was not flammable, it was uh, intended to be uh, for private use, so to be used at home uh, in a safety way. And the content, as you can see, is not in motion. But we uh, also can uh, add that the loops, the link uh, of the loops with other uh, pre-cinema system is also obvious. For example, the first edition of the animation movies of the theater optique by Émile Reynaud. The proxinoscope and zootrope uh, can be seen also uh, as ancestors of the loops, as uh, since they play on the repetition uh, of the movement of different figures. And uh, they were uh, modeling the way of viewing um, uh, this kind of experience. So yes, um, Caroline uh, mentioned horizontal system. So uh, the Emile Reynaud uh, system is quite, as you can see, is, uh, is taking back in some ways the way that we were sliding with the, um, the slides on the, in the lantern. 
So one of the first uh, horizontal system is seen here on this Ernest Planck model uh, with this small little box and you could turn the, the film inside the, the, these rounded boxes from one side to another side, um, which is a, an interesting system and probably didn't need perforations on this one. But then hybrid system arrive, uh, which is quite interesting. They were not all hybrid with a pass view uh, of slides, but some of them were. And in some general articles that we could find, um, there is a possibility, theoretical possibility, to, uh, to show both slide and film together, which means that the slide will be the, the set the background and the film uh, looping would be would show a figure in movement so the simultaneous possibility is there but it could be of course played uh, separately so horizontal loops um, what do we mean by horizontal loops it's also a format a frame format uh, because uh, when we know film, <laughs> and some of you probably already have seen a real film, 35 millimeter, normally the figures are on the other side, reverse side. Uh, here the framing is very strange. Uh, actually, it's, uh, it, it means that the playing was uh, horizontal. And one thing that is quite interesting is that um, these loops that are um, made for entertainment are actually uh, taking back, for some of them, it's a tradition coming from the uh, scientific studies and mostly I couldn't, uh, I really thought about uh, Marais and Demeny uh, studies on movements um, when I saw this uh, little dancer. Um, and also because uh, Marianne Demeny uh, patented in 1894 as a horizontal system of vision projection, uh, I think that the model doesn't exist anymore, I mean the, the apparatus, but here you can see Eugène Sando, uh, is, and for Marais, the study of the movement was interesting because Eugène Sando has so much muscles, he was uh, the muscle of the universe, that we could see everything moving on his body. Uh, so yes, that, that's the, I think the, the sort of uh, inheritance, uh, inheritance of the loops of coming from uh, this kind of scientific studies. Also, yeah, the uh, fun thing with loops is that you can basically play it uh, in the, in, the, in the reverse sense, you can even flip the image, it doesn't change anything. So you can see what you see uh, in the other, in other way, which is kind of fun. So these films were called little films, which is kind of uh, an interesting um, name. Um, uh, here you can see, uh, I think it's a Bing, yeah, uh, catalog, so you could buy it like slides uh, for your home and uh, project it uh, manually on your uh, toy lantern. But then um, lithofilm come also from a very precise technique called the chromolithography. Here it's another catalog selling them. So the chromolithography process um, was actually uh, patented in 1837 by a Frenchman called uh, Godefroy Engelmann. Uh, it was supposedly an improvement from lithography, which was a German invention, invention, of course, but it was supposed to be more precise and more efficient in the speed you could print things. But it, it was still in a manual way that you were printing uh, chromolithography in the 30s, 40s. Here it's an example uh, of a book with this decoration made in, with the system of chromolithography. Uh, it's only in the uh, 1850s that the, the system was mechanized, so we could call it the litho machines. We were printing uh, the colors into the 
paper first, but then it came to the world of the slides, as we know. So paper, posters, were in chromolithography. And chromolithography was uh, uh, available for slides, so that means you could have, even you can make yourself your own slide by cutting this already printed on tra transparent sheet uh, um, drawing. Uh, it was most of the time famous adaptation of tales or stories. Uh, for example, Alice is uh, Underground was uh, one of the famous uh, chromolithography sold in the 1870s, starting 1870s. And I passed the word to you. <laughs> Yes, we are really interactive. Um, so um, then we found a patent because there was a lot of mystery uh, in the making of this uh, chromolithography as they were toys and uh, with toy manufacturers, we don't really find uh, a lot of information about this. Uh, but uh, we found uh, this patent, uh, that patent in uh, Germany, and it's a 1921 patent who can, that can confirm uh, really uh, the uh, way, the first hypothesis we had looking at the materials that the first loop were printed and uh, lithographed on wide celluloid plates uh, that were cropped into loops afterwards. This explains the presence of uh, borders a uh, lot of time uh, at the edge of uh, the, the loops. And uh, uh, that explains also that the perforations that were made after uh, this cutting were also irregular, creating uh, sometimes uh, uh, problems of, uh, for, for the framing. The 1921 patents uh, explains also um, how they made an improvement of the technique in this moment. And it's very interesting because uh, they began to use, um, already uh, used um, uh, negatives from a cinema. Um, and they, they began to recycle them and uh, to make uh, the loops uh, on the old uh, films. And that's very interesting because uh, it helps us to develop the technique and to make it more precise because they enhance the fact that there were a lot of defects due to uh, the, the fact that they were uh, making this cutting afterwards. And uh, yes. Mm. So. Um, the technique uh, uh, that was used uh, to make uh, the loops uh, was mainly the decalcomania, but uh, we uh, don't exactly know if it was uh, decalcomania or rotoscopy, a process that was invented uh, and patented by the Fleischer brothers in uh, 1916. Um, so for the moment, it's, it's just an hypothesis that it was more decalcomania. Uh, used and you can see there the serpentine dance of Louis Fuller and uh, the loop uh, made uh, just copying, uh, just de decalcomaning <laughs> uh, the, uh, the the film. Um, yeah. And uh, here you have the process of rotoscopy that was uh, mainly used for animation afterwards, but there is really links between this animation world and uh, the, the loops. And uh, um, some of the characteristics uh, of the imprecise technique uh, you ha we have with decalcomania that was uh, not really precise because uh, uh, the film is really uh, little, and then with uh, these problems, the patent of 1921 uh, enhanced, uh, was the irregular borders of uh, the colors. And we can see that the chromolithographic process has some uh, defects there. Uh, this is a Melies uh, copy uh, of um, uh, Guillaume Tell uh, that was uh, decalcomanied in this, our most uh, Swiss uh, loop of the collection. <laughs> so, um, 
So now I will uh, give uh, the floor to Céline for uh, the content part. Yes, so we try to make a sort of classification of genres, but it's very uh, wide. Uh, there are many, many different uh, things, but basically what we could find in the huge collection of Cinematheque Suisse uh, was um, a, a theme very connected to musical and circus. Uh, some tales, but not so much. We were quite surprised. Uh, and uh, gags and nat native animation. So you already saw the Loy Filler film. Uh, so the um, trick films were also rotoscopied or copied. Um, this one is quite funny, but yeah, it's a real performance uh, that existed, existed on film. Uh, the acrobats we, we've seen, I mean, the acrobats don't work, but we've seen so, an example with Guillaume Tell and La Roseur Arrosée, so fam very, one of the most famous gag of history of cinema, probably the first one, uh, is, uh, was, of course, they call Comagné. One more time. <laughs> One last? Yeah. yeah, it works. Yeah, it's always very funny. Uh, we like this loop because they're kind of feminist gags. So um, it's a woman that is really bothered by this guy, yellow guy or blue guy. So she kind of fighting against him with a broom. And this one, we really like this one because it's one of the rare um, loop where we have a sort of uh, panoramic effect. So there is a combination of the movement of the characters inside the image, but also it's sliding like a slide. And actually it's a movement of uh, panoramic, as we call it in cinema. It's called Ansel and Gretel. So I don't know if you've seen it, but we will replay it. So. so the walking to the house is one of the rare moments where we, the set is moving with the characters. So there is also some sort of cosmic poetry uh, that we could find in the, in the loops. And what we call the native animation is uh, where, when the rotoscopy is ending, and it's native, actually, it's a real drawing, but still referencing to other things. Uh, sorry, this one is a sneezing man, and we saw a sneezing man also in Edison's uh, catalog. So. Uh, and this one is probably um, uh, Emil Cole uh, drawing as well. Uh, Emil Cole, will, will, he will be famous then after in cinema for his animation. And we are some types of uh, photographic loops. Um, so it looks like it's still ink pressed on the film, but it's, so it, it looks like almost like a cyan, cyanotype. We're not sure about the process here, so more research is, needs to be done. So, uh, to conclude, uh, we see that uh, we are really at the beginning of an ongoing uh, research and ongoing process uh, because uh, we have still a lot of work to do uh, and um, the different uh, things we have to do is uh, identify uh, more precisely the loops because there were titles, they are linked with catalogues, with uh, manufacturers and even if we don't uh, find 
uh, so much uh, information, we uh, have a lot of different um, possibilities um, going to the, uh, for, in for instance, with the Museum of uh, Nuremberg, Museum of Toys that uh, uh, preserve a lot of catalogues. So it's uh, really important to make this research. And uh, we would want also to identify more precisely the chemical composition of the films, uh, because we see that there is uh, some safety films uh, much before uh, um, safety films were invented and uh, much before 16 millimeter or 9.5 millimeter were invented for private use, because um, not a lot of the loops were nitrate. Um, we also uh, want to um, study the, the use of these uh, chromolithographic uh, lanterns um, because normally they always come from the museums, from private collections, and we don't really know uh, their life before they arrived at the archive because they were already collected in some way with collectors that gathered also uh, magic lanterns, toy magic lanterns, and that's why uh, their history is uh, really not well known uh, of what uh, the history of the reception is not done at all. So uh, yes, I think it's, it's quite interesting research to do. And um, we um, we'll be grateful if uh, anybody has more information uh, to give and uh, more uh, collection to share and um, maybe making a um, um, collaborative project could be also a solution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline and uh, Céline, for... Uh, bringing in also this uh, perspective from um, conservation and restoration, also while well, sharing this, this new material on, on well, what we, could be call, what we can call maybe a variation on a toy lantern in a way, but also for bringing in this perspective of conservation and restoration because that uh, allows me also, it's a nice bridge to our next speaker, um, Eloise Gaillard. Um, she works also now as a, as a conservator, I can call, I think, um, at the Musée des Arts Forains in Paris. So I'm very, very happy that, that she's here. Um, Eloise holds a thesis in history of art and heritage and ethno-history and uh, worked for uh, several years at the Museum uh, of Civilization of Europe and the Mediterranean. So I think it's now called Mutsam at, uh, in Marseille, where I was recently, thanks to uh, Eloise. Um, but now, so she works uh, in Paris at the Fairground Museum, which is also something I would uh, highly recommend to visit when you are there. Um, and I also want to mention that Eloise was one of the coordinators or the coordinator uh, of the Candice Dissy of Fairground Culture that was uh, submitted to UNESCO last year, I think, in May, um, to uh, be accepted or recognized as a form of intangible cultural heritage. Eloise. I invite you to the floor. And I have to say that the answer of the UNESCO will arrive in October, so please cross your fingers. So, um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all the Be Magic team uh, and specifically Nele and Court for um, coming in Paris and finding me in last fall uh, in my cave, well, my museum, it's quite the same actually. Um, so the presentation you're going to see this afternoon is about a real new research which began in last September and um, well uh, since then we've decided to move uh, a huge part of the museum so I worked very hard by moving objects uh, for the last three weeks. So, um, well, I'm sorry for my English and my very bad accent because I'm totally tired. So, uh, well, as I'm French, this is not totally my fault, actually. So, 
Um, as Nell mentioned it, uh, I'm the curator of uh, Les Pavillons de Bercy, which is well known as the Musée des Arts Forains, the Fragrant Arts Museum. So as the carousels also seem to be a parallel topic today. So uh, let's start with a little presentation of uh, Les Pavillons de Bercy. So it's a garden hidden between all wine warehouses uh, built at the end of the 19th century and transformed 25 years ago in three different rooms. First, the Musée des Arts Forains, the Fairground Arts Museum, depicting a fairground from La Belle Époque. Then we have Les Salons Vénitiens, the Venetian rooms, um, dedicated to the 18th century uh, Venice and its carnival. And the last one, the Théâtre du Merveilleux, the Theatre of Wonders, a world of wonders and illusions. So these three rooms are linked by uh, 19th century objects. And this morning we've heard about tours and shows and a unique place gathered all kinds and types of show, the fairground. At the end of the 19th century, fairgrounds were one of the most important social phenomena. Everyone goes to the fairground. The entrance is free. Um, some rides uh, are expensive, but most of them or attraction are affordable, as today. Um, anyone, regardless of income, uh, can attend the show. And of course, the cheapest uh, entry ticket will give you a seat at the back of the room. At, a time, uh, at that time, sorry, um, there was not a lot of leisure time and no the TV or internet media that we have today. So the fairground of the 19th century was a summary um, of the world. You could ride a bicycle or drive a car on a carousel. You can see the world from above a Ferris wheel or watch a mermaid show. Uh, you could be charmed by an Indian snake charmer or play with Japanese billiards, created in Belgium, actually. And you could also have fun and step into a world of science and illusion. Science and illusions. The showmen were the masters in the art of linking these two things. At the fairground, we could have wax museums. Here you have the Grand Panopticum du Puitrain. Uh, in those kind of museums, uh, you, could be, uh, you could admire, for example, a dissection of a human arm. Well, right. Um, but also uh, the customs of the inhabitants of Patagonia. Um, you could question a fortune tailor attended the first screening uh, of the cinema, or meet amusing science and its optical illusions. But before all that new shows, there was the pre-cinema show. This painting um, was presented during fairgrounds at the end of the 19th century. We recognize the Vesuvius in the Bay of Napoli. It's just a bonal canvas, except that it was painted using a process developed by Louis Daguerre in the middle of the 19th century. This canvas is painted on both sides. And this peaceful afternoon is followed by a night eruption. So this phenomena um, appears just because the light comes, oh, sorry, I can go back, yeah, from the front or for the back of the canvas. Louis Daguerre, were known for its diorama, the almost may, maybe no discovery of the photography, and we won't discuss it here in this museum, and this very special technique. Uh, if you look on internet, uh, you could find a lot of kind of this painting made. This, this was not made by Daguerre, but Daguerre uh, made some canvas from this size. 
this one is about um, four meter longs on three meter tall. So it's a very huge uh, canvas. This technique uh, was used by a showman. The showmen have always offered for money. So, well, it's not very offered, but the best entertainment uh, technology to their visitors. They proposed the newest techniques to upgrade their attractions, their booths, their carousels, and actually they still do um, the same today. Among these great showmen, we found in Belgium and in the north of France, the Van de Voorde family. They traveled to the fairs between the 1880s and 1920s with their Théâtre Mécanique Morieux, the Mechanical Theatre Morieux, um, which brought together a mechanical theater with mechanical puppets, biggest puppets, and you have um, on the left the three, the images in the middle, you could see some little acrobats. Uh, those are these puppets. Um, Van der Voorde also had um, cycloramas and the images on the top uh, of the posters uh, represent, um, it's a part of a huge cyclorama uh, represented the Universal Exhibition in Paris in 1900. And here you have the Palace of Electricity, Le Palais de l'Electricité, uh, which was one of the biggest attraction of the Universal Exhibition this year. The Van de Voorde also uh, had cinema and magic lanterns. Um, many slides, telling stories painted with bright colors uh, from this theater, from this theater, sorry, uh, have been found over the years um, and are now kept in private collections. We don't have uh, any of them in Les Pavillons de Bercy, but on the other hand, we have about 12, 15 uh, special effects slides. We have chromatrops, like this one or this. And here we have a perfect example of a pure optical illusion, uh, such you could have on a kaleidoscope, for example. Some of the slides show um, meteorological, it's a difficult word, um, meteorological elements. So here you have clouds and a darker uh, view of this slide. And all the slides offer real moving effects. So here you have waves. Oh, those two pictures are from the same uh, slides. Because this is a moving one. So here uh, on the right you have uh, the back of the, of the plate and the mechanism that allows uh, it to be operated. So we can imagine uh, a slide describing a boat on the sea, projected on a wall, maybe with a triple lantern of Maldon, maybe. Um, and this was a slide um, projected above, and by turning the crank here, we obtain a moving sea. Some of the slides um, make it possible to obtain a day and night effect. Here, you have a full moon rising uh, over the sea. Um, yes, it's the sea again. Uh, and I would just like to uh, remind you that uh, the topic of the sea has often been represented and used um, by the showmen. Some carousels uh, were called wave rides, les vagues de l'océan with moving boats. Um, some swings boats are made in the shape of real little boats. And uh, some showmen also proposed shows of more or less realistic mermaids. We don't know. Um, so yes, we don't know what is a real mermaid. Um, because at the time, uh, many, a lot of people um, who visited the fairgrounds never had seen the sea. Uh, they, they won't go uh, on holidays on the beach. So uh, the showman brings um, the, um, the sea to the visitors. So with uh, these slides, 
we are here in the presence of a series of slides presenting different types of effects used by the Van de Voorde in their Morieu theater. So now, uh, two questions arise. The first is purely historical, so it's for me. How were these plates used? We see uh, different types of number um, on the supports. They are not the same, not the same shape. So what do uh, they correspond to? Uh, so this is the next step uh, of my study, to understand how and on which show um, these slides uh, have been used. So uh, if you look at this castle, uh, the question maybe you, um, in which landscape, with which landscape uh, does it fit? Or um, here we have a wonderful rainbow and uh, maybe this label uh, could help us to uh, understand more things about it and uh, it used. And the other question is now, what do we do uh, with these slides? Have you seen in the photographs at the beginning of the presentation, uh, Les Pavillons de Bercy is a living museum. We don't have any uh, showcases, any labels, any barriers. Um, all the objects that we present uh, speak to the visitors. A merry-go-round was built to turn, so it turned in the museum. So the magic lantern slides um, were made to be presented. So how could we present them now? Jean-Paul Favon, the creator and owner of the museum, decided to bring the objects uh, from the Moyeux Theatre to life. Here you have a canvas painting using the daguerre technique. And so um, the things you are going to see right now is a very work in progress. Um, like the showman uh, before him, Jean-Paul Favon uses the latest technologies to offer shows to the museum visitors by adding some object more than a century old. Here, um, the canvas, the painting, is uh, in a game, a derby game, uh, built in the 1960s, so it's a ultra-modern object for us in the museum. And uh, Jean-Paul Favon decided to place on different effects. Close of you. So uh, you have on the right um, backlight effect. So you could see the night vision just on the on the on the right. Sorry. Uh, you have snow on the top and uh, an aurora borealis uh, all along the painting. The last two effects are not from the original painting. They are just just the backlight uh, was used by the Van der Voorde. So Mr. Favon decided to add projection of natural things by using a video projector. So we, for him, the video projector could be a hair of the magic lantern. It works quietly the same. So uh, you have here some snowflakes. And here maybe remind you uh, some um, string of lights or rain or the aurora borealis. So um, with glass slides or video images, the magic works. So to finish, uh, I'd like to show you two short uh, parts of another show uh, that we realized 10 years ago in the museum in the Venetian room, um, which mixed um, 19th century uh, mechanical puppets from the Morieux Theatre. So you could see the little boat uh, on the left and the video images. So that could give you uh, an idea of uh, which this uh, previous show um, could be maybe soon, I hope. So in the real show in the room, there is uh, loud music uh, all in the room and sometimes baby crying too. It, it's a problem of a living museum. So here you have the real boats um, which are moving on the top. 
and the video projection uh, above them. So we transformed the entire room by using a new magic lantern. So I hope to see you in the museum soon. Thank you. Thank you, Eloise, and uh, keep your questions uh, for later because there's one uh, paper left. Um, thanks for bringing in also this whole this question of um, what could say creative re reuse or how to well work with the contemporary lantern or to, to with lantern old lantern slides today. How can we integrate them? How in new shows? That is also the subject of a panel tomorrow. So uh, stay with us till, till tomorrow. Um, for the last. Uh, paper of to this, this panel, I would like to invite Susan Ray, uh, introduce Susan. Um, she is an independent researcher and member of both the Magic Lantern Society of the United States and Canada and the International Panorama Council. Uh, she's, what I learned, a very passionate media archaeologist since years, and she has, amongst others, collaborated a lot with Erki Hutamo, which is also a bit of a bridge with uh, the former presentation, because I know that uh, Erki also has been working in the museum in Paris. So, Suzanne? Thank you. Robert Winter was one of many, many showmen traveling with moving panoramas, magic lanterns, etc., etc., in the 19th century. Newspaper advertising and family letters make it possible to follow his travels and the changes in his unrivaled exhibition through the years. Robert Winter traveled from 1843 until 1864 around the United States to Canada to Cuba, even to Peru in South America, where he exhibited a few days after an earthquake. He traveled by canal boat on a newly opened canal in the United States. He traveled by steamship to Panama, crossed the isthmus, continued to California. He first showed chemical dioramas, but the content of his exhibition changed as time passed. He added a magic lantern, showing chromatropes and dissolving views. Robert Winter, actually Robert Winter Jr., was born in England in 1821 and became a United States citizen in Cincinnati in 1842. In that same year, two showmen called Mafia and Lenati came to Cincinnati and showed what they call Daguerre's dioramas. They claimed that these were real dioramas painted in Paris by Daguerre and arrived in New York with these in 1840, traveled around with them until the paintings were destroyed by fire. It's very unlikely that these were painted by Daguerre. They were too small, and the traveling showmen would not be able to create the elaborate lighting effects needed using daylight. Somehow, Winter managed to copy Maffei and Lenati's show. I suspect he was a musician, who accompanied their exhibition. He played the violoncello. His brother, Charles, played violin. They were both listed as musicians in the city directory. Winter's work, in the words of one newspaper, not only imitated but excelled the celebrated chemical pictures of Daguerre. After successfully exhibiting his work in Cincinnati, Winter and his brother set off for New York, where, as a family member wrote, it is generally supposed they will make their fortune. The New York exhibition began in 1843 in Brooklyn, then moved to the granite buildings in New York City. Three weeks later, there was a fire. It destroyed one of his paintings and damaged the others. But he was able to open again shortly after thereafter. He started now with diaphanous paintings and followed that with the three surviving chemical paintings in the style of Daguerre. Advertisements stated that each painting represented two distinct pictures, 
that the dis style of execution and the illuminating powers employed produced the changes. So these were double effect dioramas. A family letter describes them. They appear to me about 12 feet square. They at first represent a daylight view and undergo their different changes to twilight, moonlight, and night. You cannot imagine how the change is produced, and you are astonished at objects appearing or disappearing on the canvas. These paintings, then, I would say are transparent. They're also painted on both sides. On the one, objects that appear in the day view, and on the other, objects that appear at night view and changing as the light is made to pass from the front to the back of the pictures. The Cathedral of Milan, the City of Jerusalem and the Crucifixion, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and Belshazzar's Feast were the diorama subjects he showed most frequently. Some of the subjects were associated with Daguerre's diorama, and others were probably based on the apocalyptic paintings of John Martin. The exhibition was accompanied by music. Winter's brother Charles played violin. Robert played violoncello. A pianist often accompanied the show as well, and sometimes they brought the piano along with them. In other occasions, or in other locations, there was a brass band to provide music. After almost five months, Winter's exhibition traveled to Boston, where it was termed a rational entertainment and well-deserving patronage. By this time, 1844, the name has been changed to Chemical Dioramas. Winter then traveled to Baltimore, where he called the show Magnificent and Unrivaled Exhibition of Illuminated Chemical Dioramas, and variations on that name were used for many years. After traveling through upstate New York towns and Toronto and Quebec, Canada, Winter returned to Cincinnati via a new route, a combination of travel by canal boat, then steamboat and railroad that took 56 hours traveled 247 miles at a total cost of $18.50, as reported in a newspaper. All four chemical dioramas were shown in Washington, D.C., along with six chromatic views. These were described as being circular in form and painted on canvas. R. Winter's original and unrivaled dioramas and chromatrope views opened in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, in 1849. All four chemical dioramas were to be shown and the evening's entertainment to conclude with six chromatrope views to be shown for the first time. I suspect that he added the magic lantern in part to make the exhibition more easily portable. Winter described a marketing success in Cleveland. We did a very, very good business, having adopted the plan of getting over 300 envelopes put inside a handbill, a book with the opinions of the press, and a neat card bearing my name. They were directed to the lady and the gentleman of the house. It had the desired effect. In 1850, in Utica, New York, the exhibition reopened the museum, and dissolving views had been added before the six chromatrope views and three of the celebrated chemical dioramas. There, they exhibited for 10 weeks, and to quote Robert, we did tremendous business from the word go, some days giving three exhibitions and turning away over 250 persons on the last night, which is very good for a small town. In, an uncle, in a letter to his uncle George, Robert wrote that his big fiddle was a big attraction and that a piano forte player was traveling with him. We find it a great advantage to open with the dissolving views in connection with the dioramas. We also introduce between the chromatropes, comic slides, and portraits. This relieves the eye and gives more variety. I have adapted to them one of my lights in place of the Drummond light, and they show splendidly. A snow scene in which snow appeared to fall was an audience favorite, and a storm scene which showed lightning and falling rain. Robert wrote that he intended to give up his exhibition business and go into glass blowing in Pittsburgh but he didn't. He showed his dioramas in Indiana, where he also visited his uncle, George Winter. Winter is an artist who is best remembered for his paintings of Native Americans, 
uh, recording in images and writing what was then a vanishing culture. George was inspired to ask one of his brothers to investigate the purchase of a magic lantern gas apparatus with the idea of starting an Indian gallery, no doubt inspired by Robert Shaw. In early 1851, Robert wrote again to Uncle George about a new addition to his show, shifting patterns derived from oriental textiles. I got you the finest thing out. I don't care where it is. I have termed it Hydra Oxygen Oriental Changes. I can show all the most gorgeous and brilliant patterns that the imagination can conceive, ever changing and but seldom if ever the same thing twice. I have a great variety of classes of patterns. Some are the exact resemblance of Turkish carpets, only a little more showy. Some look like patterns on fur, others again as if on velvet, satin, etc. I wish you could see them. I know you would enjoy them. These things can only be shown by the aid of the Drummond light. Robert painted these slides himself. Like most members of the Winter family, he had artistic and musical talent. Back in upstate New York, diaphanous and chemical paintings were advertised, and dissolving views, too numerous to mention, followed by metamorphosis, six chromatropes, and then the chemical dioramas, all accompanied by Boswell's brass band. In late 1851, Uncle George Winter opened his Elidoric paintings and dissolving views in Lafayette, Indiana. The painting showed lore European landscapes, but the dissolving views attracted more attention. The show traveled locally, but there were problems with a Dr. Curtis, probably the manager, and George returned to painting. Robert introduced his oriental changes in Pittsburgh with the dioramas and 16 dissolving views. He had added two new dioramas and was performing many interesting and amusing experiments with the drum and light. He had also begun to show his exhibitions in smaller towns where fewer amusements meant less competition and perhaps more profit. In 1853, Winter showed his unrivaled exhibit of fading crystalline views in Panama City, Panama and played musical selections. He crossed the isthmus, probably traveling on the partially completed Panama Railroad and continued to San Francisco. It seems that he only had his magic lantern with him at this point. We next find him in Lima, Peru, where his brother William had established a successful business. In a letter written to a Cincinnati friend, Robert described in detail his experiences in an earthquake and its aftershocks. Although the police had closed the theater, they did not stop winter show, and he wrote, I opened on the second night after the great quake and had full houses three nights in succession, thus shaking the dollars into my treasury. In 1855, the show consisted of six 18 crystalline views, as he had renamed his dissolving views, shown by the aid of the drum and light, Turkish chromatropes, pleasing and laughable metamorphosis followed, and then two chemical dioramas. Sometime around 1856, Winter found time to marry. He and his wife Josephine had ultimately had five children, a daughter, four sons, but he didn't settle down. In 1859, he was in Havana, Cuba, showing the chemical dioramas. Later that same year, he traveled the New England states with a Dr. Valentine, who was a well-known comedian. During the years of the Civil War, he seems to have remained in Pennsylvania, perhaps as a daguerreotypist. In 1864, Thomas Funston, who had experience in the show business, and was recovering from wounds received in the Civil War, associated himself with Winter. The two traveled to California, taking the diorama of the Holy Land and what they called the Stereoscopticon. Platt's Music Hall in San Francisco was the site of their shows. Giant stereoscopic pictures, views of home, eastern cities, statuary, portraits, Civil War battlefields, and portraits of generals. Billed as the great art wonder of the age, the show traveled to other cities, but it was not a success. Charles Winter wrote that he had to loan several hundred dollars to assist Robert and his partner. 
and later advertisements for the show omit Winter's name. In 1864 and 1865, Robert Winter exhibited watercolors and photographs at the Industrial Exhibition in San Francisco. And between 1869 and 1872, he partnered with Wilbur Bailey in a photography business located next to McGuire's Opera House. And you can barely see the sign there. He was granted a patent for improvements in coloring photographs in oil and watercolors and he was listed as an artist in advertising for the photographic gallery and later as an artist for a Jacob Chu. George Winter's daughter visited Robert and his family, writing that they live in a very pretty part of the city near the bay. She described Robert playing his violoncello to accompany his daughter Emma on the piano. Winter was very active in the local Odd Fellows fraternal organization he may have possibly been a member while he was traveling. He exhibited in Odd Fellows Halls in several cities. In 1890, he placed this newspaper advertisement. His English-made violoncello was for sale. To me, this seemed to mark an end to his career as a showman. Although he had been established in San Francisco as a photographer and an artist for many years, he had never sold the musical instrument that had accompanied his unrivaled exhibitions. Robert Winter died in San Francisco, California on July 31st, 1893. Thank you, Susan, for this other Another wonderful example of how the lantern was introduced in, in a particular kind of show. Um, may I invite you, uh, in the informal style that uh, Frank nicely introduced yesterday, uh, to sit and, uh, on, on the stage here to ask uh, to respond to questions from the room. There are chairs, but I like the informal uh, way of sitting here, if you agree. Questions? There's one in the back. Okay, so there's a question on the presence of the sea that was in your presentation, and the question is whether you have come across or no examples of aquariums that was indeed a craze in Europe at the time. I think you mentioned one. Yes, um, we have uh, mention of some, but not a lot. Um, there were more than... Uh, kind of real zoo uh, on the fairground. Uh, lions and tigers are uh, the best um, animals on the fairgrounds. Um, we've had some aquariums, but um, mostly with uh, fake animals inside. Um, real uh, boxes with water, with fake things inside, fake snakes, fake mermaids. And I don't know if you've ever seen the mermaid in the British Museum, which is a body of um, fish and the head of a monkey. So the mix of the two is a mermaid for um, in the cabinet of curiosity. And it was the same uh, for the showman. We have some, but mostly fake ones. It was also complicated, I guess, because they traveled around to keep these fish alive. Yeah, there's a question uh, back in the back as well. Yeah, uh, Artemis. Another great panel. And um, I think it's so interesting that exhibition culture, which at some point is kind of a bit more um, site specific and fixed, you know, whether it's Egyptian Hall or, you know, Barnum's Museum or whatever, is, is taken on the road or the fairground, which is still a kind of a rather large thing that's touring, somehow able to 
get, you know, condensed, repackaged, and you know, uh, the fairground with the with the Moria and the and the you know Zion Museum with uh, Suzanne's exhibition. And I think that actually, if I wonder, you know, how much the lantern facilitated that um, that more portability and mobility. Is it directed to someone particularly, or no? Just an open question uh, about the role of the lantern in this exhibiting culture, and particularly with regard to the well, traveling entertainment or traveling activity. Making, Mo making yes, the, the role of the lantern as in this uh, mobility of exhibition culture. Who wants to take that first, Suzanne? I can give one example. Um, Henry Lewis painted a Mississippi panorama, a moving panorama, which was very large. And in his writings uh, to his brother, I believe it was, he at one point contemplated replacing the whole thing with a magic lantern show. He had seen one. He got the price. He knew that it would be much more portable. He would have an artist paint the slides. And the artist would travel with them so they could paint new slides as they traveled along. He ultimately did not do that, but he looked at it very closely. It would also be a lot cheaper than carrying the moving panorama. Mm. It's, well, the showmen use uh, magic lanterns to, um, to, to spear some new information. Uh, but it was, it's quite of tiny, a magic lantern. Um, the Morio, for example, uh, uh, the Van de Voorde had a cyclorama about 90 meters long about the um, discovery of the world from Ostend to the Sahara. So they have tiny things and huge things. So they always, well, at the beginning, they use tiny things. And the, um, the object they use uh, became bigger and bigger with, uh, with train and with trucks. So they use also new uh, technology to move the fairground to transform uh, the way to uh, inform the population. OK, yeah, there's another question. So it's, if I can paraphrase very shortly, so the first remark was regarding the link with Matt Kloss painting in science fiction films. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. It's, is someone, because you had two remarks, I start with the first one. Is someone willing to respond to this first suggestion of the lantern as a predecessor of this kind of tradition in science fiction? Or maybe, yeah, but it was, you didn't understand in the back? Okay, I'll just grab, give you the mic. Uh, well, yes, well, this mud glass painting is used in scientific movies and in other uh, entertainment movies from the 50s, 60s up to the 80s. For instance, Mary Poppins and Star Wars. And they're using huge glass panels painted, illuminated from the back, in front of which things happen, mechanically-wise or acting-wise by actors. So I think it's a continuum of what I'm hearing here. That's all. That was not really a question. It was more a kind of a thought, right? You want to share? Um, and then there was another uh, suggestion that he was referring to... Uh, Practices actually that often called diorama in the Natural History Museum that still exist in Brussels, where reptiles are on on show, real reptiles in there. Well, it's true that kind of fake reptiles, but in in dioramic settings. So yeah, and it's true that kind of traditions. Well, the the what what was on show in the fairground was kind of similar often. Yeah. Do you want to add on that? Okay. More questions or thoughts, Abine? I'm just. This way. Oh, thank you. This is a question for Celine and Carolina. Um, when a new toy is introduced, they start to do it as perfect as possible, and when it becomes mass production, it gets more and more shabby. When I see that in the 1920s, they uh, patent uh, a new system, and it looks like a shabby. Uh, because of chromolithography, um, I wonder in how far is it still new? Is it something they needed to replace the old toy lantern because they wanted movement now? Or what could you tell us about it? Well, it's hard to answer that question, but I, I would say that the patent, you probably referred to the Bing patent from, the 19, from 1921. Yeah, it's an improvement of an already existing system, um, which means they wanted to improve it, um, make it uh, more precise with uh, machines. But it, this patent uh, actually, and you're right to point the, the date, happens when yeah, the system is becoming completely obsolete and maybe it's not interesting people anymore. I don't know if Caroline is... Yeah, I think this, uh, this uh, uh, being in the plank lanterns exists uh, um, until uh, the 50s, more or less, but uh, they became more and more unpopular uh, because really cin cinema had uh, much poor much more powerful effect and uh, it didn't create any more this uh, illusion uh, that uh, was made at home because there were also other kind of uh, cinema for uh, home cinema like uh, Pate Baby um, um, that was invented in 1922 uh, or 16mm um, um, yes, 1923. So uh, there were already other systems to project film at home. So I don't know if we answer the question more or less. <laughs> I'll bring you the mic. Thanks to all speakers. A uh, question for uh, Celine and Caroline. Uh, did you find traces of the, the apparatuses that were used uh, in the printing processes uh, or um, some kind of uh, plans of, of those machines that were used? Could you say a little bit more about that? Well, I think we, did, we didn't find actually anything, uh, not yet, but we find the patent. Uh, that's already something because uh, before we were just making hypotheses about how they were made, looking at the material and, and saying, oh, that's a line. So maybe it was uh, cut 
afterwards and this kind of uh, conclusions. But uh, now that we have this patent, we confirm some hypotheses, but we don't have uh, plans. Uh, we actually have plans for the uh, machines itself, so the hybrid uh, magic lantern, and also for um, the malted cross. Uh, that was, uh, yes. You yeah, know, it's a good question. The printing machine is still a mystery for me. But um, hopefully we will find, uh, maybe, in a, maybe it wasn't, because we found, um, like many other sources, we found it online, the patterns, but maybe not everything was digitized yet. So we have to go to, to the sources and find um, the, the drawings. But uh, also, yeah, it's, uh, it's true that uh, sometimes also when even a patent doesn't say everything, uh, for experience, Technicolor was... Uh, kind of showing the plans of the printer, printing machine, but it was never exactly that because they were afraid of the uh, spies and concurrency. So, But yes, hopefully we will find something. <laughs> there was a question by Martin, and then afterwards a question uh, from Erki. Just a quick one for uh, S Suzanne. W why were they called chemical paintings, since the effect is mainly optical and retinal, uh, why, yeah, why, what's about chemical that make, makes it precipitous? One possibility is that it refers to the light, the chemical lights that were used uh, to change the effects. I also suspect that at some point, some of the showmen were calling it chemical because Daguerre had already invented photography. And people were hearing about that. And of course, if you had called your show chemical, it would be newer. It would also sound very mysterious, so more people might come. That I've not been able to prove, but early writings on uh, discovery of chemistry or discovery of photography at the time often mention it as a chemical process. to give it maybe a scientific flavor as well, I guess. I'll pass the mic to Erki. Yes, hi. So the, um, I'll try to be brief. Uh, first of all, uh, let me just kind of, um, I have two, two brief things. I, I would like to uh, compliment actually publicly uh, Suzanne uh, for her research because because uh, Susan makes it so, <laughs> when she gives a, such a fluent presentation, she makes it sort of like sound and look so easy to sort of like find out about Robert Winter. But what an incredible painstaking research for years it has been to be able to profile this ephemeral career, which is actually extremely fascinating. So about, who, about whom no one knows in the world anything except Susan Ray. And, uh, and so I just thought that I needed to sort of like say this because I have been following this for about maybe 15 years or so, how, how this, <laughs> had this knowledge little piece by piece by this painstaking uh, detective work with archives happens, you know, I think it needs to be highlighted. But uh, I have a, another very, very quick question about these, um, these film loops. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that, the, as you pointed out, that the early, early loops for those carrot uh, projectors around 1897 uh, are horizontal. And uh, so, the, so that the fact that it, it loose, moves horizontally, and you gave a couple of um, uh, possibility, possible background features like the Théâtre Optique, uh, Emile Reynaud Théâtre Optique, and like that. But I'm just kind of wondering if there are many, any other ways to think about that. Obviously, that was an early time for the, the film culture, so it's actually astonishingly early that these... This, uh, film loops, at which were actually also used in, in projections, uh, like the Edison spool bank uh, machines. Uh, uh, so, so this is a very early moment. So obviously this whole idea of like projecting from reels running vertically hadn't been uh, sort of like 
fixed as the standard yet. But I, I'm just kind of wondering if it was, was also simply for the fact that you actually could make the loops longer when when you put them horizontally. Because if you have looked at those carrot machines, I have all those machines in my collection, the earliest ones. So you can actually extend. <laughs> there are two types. Either the loop is completely loose without any reels, so which you can actually make it much longer, or or you can actually have um, a adjustable set of reels that are horizontal. So those are obviously technical explanations. So you want to actually extend the length, but I'm just kind of wondering if you have even other ideas why why these early toy manufacturers who brought this novelty to the market actually uh, resorted to this horizontal format until they switched to the vertical standard, later standard vertical format. Very tough question. <laughs> no, thank you very much for this question. We actually wonder also because um, why this switch from horizontal to vertical? It's true that the, the even the kinematograph made by um, I think it was um, Bing. No, kinematograph was well was a horizontal system, um, and so. Um, was it possible to make it longer with the horizontal system? You seem to know the question because you have yourself. I didn't know. I thought precisely that we switched to vertical to make longer loops. Uh, so it's not, so we have yeah. at least a first answer. It was not the reason. Um, also, maybe uh, the idea to, in the hybrid system, to, the idea to be, um, to have the possibility to project both slides and film made it um, maybe one of the reasons. Uh, but then, was it easier to do vertical projection? I don't know. It's, uh, it's something that um, we, yeah, we need to do more research about it, but it's a very good question. Well, one thing I can see is that uh, as they began to use uh, real films, uh, to to make the decalco money, they were using the film format. Uh, so the the first uh, one was using like uh, more the mare format, that was uh, much before, and then the vertical loops just adopted uh, the frame of uh, film because uh, they were using film as a basis, and uh, they were mainly decalco mania, so they had to use it like. Uh, this frame to have the same framing. I, I think it's an hypothesis, of course. I think we have time for one last question. Okay, Ivo, I'll come. And then doing some sports one in the meantime. Also for uh, Caroline and Celine, I found it very interesting those two films that were taken from Lumière and Méliès. So, do you know how soon these films were made after the original films by Méliès and Lumière were made, were made? And if they were made immediately after, what does, does that mean? And if they were not made immediately after, what does that mean? You have one. Half half minute minute to think. <laughs> um, no, we don't think it was made immediately after. Um, we're not sure about that um, because yeah, you could have um, this rotoscopy made probably ten years after. Uh, and since the what we called primitive film, it's not a good word now, but uh, we're playing a lot on movements. It was good for the loops, I suppose, but it's still a supposition. Uh, but yeah, the question also that is quite uh, difficult to answer is, um, I'm not sure, there, I think there were big copyrights issued too on, on, on that uh, reproductions. I'm not sure they were asking the authorization to reproduce it. 
um, on the catalog uh, with little films. Um, do they mention the authors, the original authors of the films that have been sold in Nito Films? I'm not sure. Well, they never mentioned that. It's uh, copied from Lumiere. And they just put like uh, clowns, uh, magicians, uh, something like this, very titles, very general titles. So, um, and it was also very interesting that they had it uh, color. Uh, of course, uh, to the original views, it's always it's, it's a sort of improvement too. And uh, yes, uh, I think um, for the Ogalo and Lortac uh, uh, loops uh, that were made by them for uh, the Lapierre uh, manufacturers, yes, I think they were they were mentioning them because it was. Uh, Obvious that they were working for them, but for the other one, I think uh, they didn't make the, the links uh, uh, between the films because, as uh, Celine said, I think it was, uh, yes, something like piracy, of course. Yeah. But, uh, we need to but yes, we, I think uh, we, in this moment, we don't have exactly the clues to know uh, when uh, exactly the, the loops were made. We have just very big um, time frames. I think I don't have the, the real datation. And that's also a research we have to do. <laughs> Still one last, last final, final question by Frank. No, it's not a question, but about the the the, the arrosé, arrosé. I mean, this was not invented; it's not a story invented by Lumiere. As we know, there's several comic versions of that, so it is a theme, a topos that's been around for a long time. So I don't think they had any worries about copyright with that particular film, because uh, this was a story that was used by so many others. Oh, that. Okay. So for those who missed that, it's still a copy, copy of the film. That's what you said, right, Celine? Or do you want to comment? No, no, it's a very good remark that the gag of Arroso Arrosé is probably a super old gag before Lumiere. But uh, yes, um, the copy of the film is an issue because, uh, and I'm not sure they ask permission to Brother Lumiere to copy it. That's, that's it. But, but thank you for the remark. So please, can I invite you to give them once more a round of applause for this wonderful panel.